Okay, hi, thank you. I'm Mike Gunning, CEO of VR Resources. Uh, thanks, John. VR hangs out at the front end of the Lausanne curve. We stick our neck out on blue sky drilling for value creation. So we're here at Toronto at MIF just to give an update on the drilling that we're going to do this year to try and create that value. And in particular, uh, two drill programs in the next four to, four to six weeks, hopefully, in Northern Ontario on the two projects that you just saw from John. This rare earth element discovery at Hecla Kilmer and this, this new Kimberlite breadship pipe at Northway nearby. Let me just, oh. yeah, there we go. Capus casing shear zone. This is a big crack in the earth's crust. It's a failed rift. It's about 1.9 billion years old. And a lot of exploration here in the 1960s and 70s in the northern part of the Capus casing, which is covered. VR's model, what VR can do is go in 50 years later and take exploration technologies that are new, that didn't exist in the 1960s, and allow you to explore undercover. Do things that Selco and Esso simply couldn't do. Also, take new mineral deposit models. Take something like an IOCG model that didn't exist in 1970. And look at this big crack in the earth for a large footprint hydrothermal system for copper and gold. And so getting involved with Hecla Kilmer over the last four years, you can see on the right-hand side of the slide the technologies that we've thrown at Hecla Kilmer. That's the nature of the terrain. You're not really in the James Bay lowlands here. You're right on the edge, so there is forest. But there's no oak crop at your feet, and you can use these new technologies to go beyond what was done historically. And so after four drill programs and 21 holes, looking at a planned magnetic map on the left, the most important thing about this new discovery is just simply the sheer scale of the system, which is what really VR looks for, is large footprint systems. So on the left, you've got a, uh, an alkaline complex. It's five by seven kilometers across. It's polyphase. You've got 21 drill holes now that have found three different areas of mineralization over about two by three kilometers. I think 16 out of 21 of those drill holes contains greater than a percent TREO. And so that scale laterally, in terms of a big hydrothermal system, is also matched vertically. And if you look at hole 13, which is from the northern end, you can see a 460 meter continuous intersection of mineralization starting at surface and going to 504 meters in depth with no real constraints for how deep could this mineralization go. The importance of that intersection is not just the TREO grade. That intersection carries just below a percent, over 460 meters, just above a percent, over 360, is what John alluded to. The, the headline in this rare earth mania, too, is TREO, which is important. But what's more important for value, where is Canada's next PMREO a mine going to be? How is a mining company going to make money on, on these deposits? is the proportion of these four perm uh, rare earth elements that go into permanent magnets. Without a permanent magnet, you don't have an electric vehicle or a wind turbine. Neodymium, prosodymium, terbium, dysprosium are what generate typically up to about 80% of the value of a TREO intersection. And I, I don't know exactly why, John, but you're right. Hecla Kilmer is blessed with a proportion of PMREO in that intersection that is 18 to 20%. Most of the light rare earth carbonatites in Canada that were discovered 50 years ago and are still in the ground are in the ground because that proportion is typically 12 to 13 percent. And so you're just not carrying the value because you don't have this. You don't have neodymium, prosodymium, terbium, dysprosium, which are driving the value of that mineralization. And you can see with terbium, you're getting up into the per ounce value for things like gold and silver. If I could just flip back to the previous slide, what that means for how do I understand these systems? If you just look at these metal prices and put it into a copper equivalency, you can look at that whole 13, 460 meter intersection from surface as an equivalency of about four to four and a half percent copper. And that's why the Hecla Kilmer system, I think, uh, matters and we're advancing. And John has showed you this. So that's how it compares in Canada in terms of being blessed with this PMREO. Globally, uh, we're just showing all the rare earth elements on the bottom. Bionobo is considered the largest rare earth element deposit in the world in China. Mountain Pass is considered the richest rare earth element deposit in the world in uh, California. 
And when you look at prosodymium, neodymium, terbium, and dysprosium, you can see that Hecla Kilmer not only competes with them in these high-priced uh, PMREOs, it actually exceeds them. And again, we, we need to find these kinds of deposits if we're going to respond as an industry to Canada virtually has no PMREO production, not strictly, but virtually. Where is it going to come from for these EV mandates that John is talking about and governments want domestic supply? Lastly, we just announced a couple of weeks ago, as John alluded to, another one of the impediments for the discoveries that have been made in Canada in the last 40 or 50 years is mineralogy. If your rare earth elements and your light rare earth carbonatite are in silicates or refractory minerals, either we can't get them out or it's just simply too expensive to get them out. And so many of these deposits have stayed in the ground. If you look at all the technology on the right-hand side of the slide that VR has thrown at Hecla Kilmer, the message two weeks ago has been the same really for three or four years. There's a very clean correlation, basically one-to-one, -one, between TREO and phosphorus, phosphate minerals like monazite. And the central image at the bottom is a scanning electron microprobe when we get into uh, mineralogy. And on the scale of microns, you can see the neodymium and the terbium with the electron beam inside monazite and inside apatite. And also in a mineral called parasite, which is a fluorocarbonate. And most of these breaches are cemented by fluorocarbonate, like you can see up in the top left. Why is that important? If you want rare earth element production in Canada, you want it in monazite because the first and only rare earth element extraction facility in Canada is in Saskatoon. You may have heard the Prime Minister just visit it recently. So you can see at Hecla Kilmer, not only do you have scale and you have composition on your side, but it looks like the mineralization is aligned with, we can get these rare earth elements out, we can extract them in Saskatoon, and that's how you get this stuff into a permanent magnet in a car plant in, in Oshawa. So this aligns with uh, the prospects for could you advance this mineralization. Lastly, all of those attributes are made better by uh, location. This is also an issue for discoveries in Canada over the last 40 to 50 years. And especially as we move into a high interest rate environment, it's just simply capex for development. The project that I'm talking about is about 23 kilometers to the right of that photo. So you have an exploration camp on the active Ontario Northern Railroad heading up to James Bay, the north end of Highway 634 at the Auto Rapids Hydroelectric Facility. It helps me in my exploration to keep my costs down. It also helps you to answer the question, what do you think the prospects are for developing this project? If, if you can check all the boxes, that slide is important. So lastly, what's next, as John's alluded to, hopefully in four to eight weeks, um, what we want to do is get the drill back to Hecla Kilmer to continue this metallogeny study. I will say, too, discovery is often quoted as an event, but I think in my view it's more of a process, right from project generation through discovery and development, and so is innovation. So here's an example of VR trying to work with this large hydrothermal system, seeing this mineralization, Last year, doing a state-of-the-art, ultra-high-resolution drone magnetic survey, something you couldn't do 10 years ago. And if you apply a new 3D MVI magnetic inversion, it maps for you the, the concentration of magnetite. And in that plan map in the middle, all of the drill holes on that plan map are carrying greater than 1% TREO in intervals. Where can you start to build volume for this mineralization? And you can see at the south end of that elongate uh, zone, that hole 13 is at the very south end of that 700 meter MVI anomaly. So to follow up on that intersection, this hopefully in about a month, we'll look at whether that can represent a volume that we can build on for this material. And ironically, if you look at the south end of that map, drill hole one, the very first drill hole in this project three years ago, we could see those magnetite and hematite veins with rare earth elements, but it looks like we're on the northern margin of where you can see concentrated magnetic susceptibility. And when we log our drill core, we have a mag sus meter. We, that correlation is basically one-to-one, -one, so the, that will likely be the first hole this spring. When you're advancing exploration, the project needs to be getting better, not going sideways. Hecla Kilmer's got better with every drill program, and yet Justin and I feel 
this spring on the fifth program, we might be able to intersect the best mineralization that Hecla Kilmer has, has produced yet. And that's why we're gonna go spend some money this spring. Just a couple of slides at the end here to comment on what happened at the end of the Hecla Kilmer drill program last November. Northway is about 10 kilometers to the south. You can see that band of the Capus Casing shear zone. Again, you can see the area of glacial cover. This is where you can go in and explore in a way that Selco and De Beers could not. Northway was a large magnetic anomaly on structure. And this hydrothermal mineralization at Hecla Kilmer is about structure and magnetic reversals. So we took our, we staked the anomaly, took our drone there, flied an ultra detailed survey, and at the end of the Hecla Kilmer program last November, we went and put a, a test hole into Northway. And in the world of blue sky, lo and behold, you don't see a carbonatite with rare earth elements. You see a green rock. And in the traditional language, that would be called a two-facetic Kimberlite breccia. You can see those beautiful circular lapilli, those accretionary lapilli, spherulites. And you can see how packed they are. And that's just speaking to the sheer energy of exploding that kimberlite diatreme, not from 10 kilometers in the crust, potentially hundreds. And you can see the variety of those xenoliths up on the top right, the light colored one. It looks more like it's sort of deep crustal, something you call a gabbro. When you look at this one, you're starting to see more olivine pyroxene, and I'll show you garnets. They're starting to look like they have potential for potentially more upper mantle like dunite. And you can also see, whoops, I'll just leave it, these calophyte rims. Northway is also dynamic. Just in 40 meters of core from the very top and the very edge. You can see in the top and the bottom of this slide, densely crystalline, in traditional language you would call it hypabyssal kimberlite or coherent kimberlite, rocks that look like a dike. Still green, still ultra basic being invaded by a true kimberlite diatreme breccia phase, blowing up through these, these other phases. And here you can see one of these spherical magma class, cored by clinopyroxene, preserved calophyte rims. That's again just speaking to deep roots and super high energy as this kimberlite is emplaced. And lastly, and importantly, as John alluded to, this is the top of the kimberlite pipe. And it is covered by Devonian red sandstone. You can see this typical blue rock, which is altered serpentinized kimberlite that's typical. And then as you move down in the core, you see these unusual blue mudstones and reworked and compacted kimberlite. And it looks like when these kimberlites come to surface, they're exploding. Just imagine uh, Mount Baker back in Vancouver where I live as a volcanic crater. They have that kind of energy. And when you see the sediments at the bottom, it looks like you're actually preserving the crater at the top of this kimberlite, which is good because that means the entire kimberlite volume is below your drill. That's the section in the plan map you saw from John. And the take home message is pretty simple. This is a 1.2 kilometer uh, target on Mag Low. Um, and once we saw that green rock in November, because we've been working with this regional data for four or five years, we went and staked 20 to 24 of these Mag Low targets that look like Northway. And so you have the potential in Northway is not just the discovery of a new Kimberlite breccia pipe, but the discovery of a previously unknown Paleozoic Kimberlite field in Northern Ontario. And again, in section, that's the cover. The historic diamond exploration is looking for mag highs, Jurassic kimberlite pipes that literally come to surface. This is buried, mag low, and it's older. It's Paleozoic. And again, on the technology side, Geotech has been publishing for the last five or 10 years to use these MVI inversions to map kimberlites. And you can see at Northway <laughs> that it works. So just to finish an old slide that Rob Boyd and John will, will recognize, this is still useful. In the heyday of Canada's diamond industry, in the mid-90s, Lac de Gras, Fort de and Victor were all coming onto the map. Uh, Fort de Corn never produced, everyone knows about Lac de Gras, it's the biggest and the most pipes. But as John alluded to, the niche for Victor, which produced for about 10 years, was simply the value, the dollar value per carat of the diamonds that came out of Victor. 
So what I would leave you with for the front end of the Lasan curve in blue sky work is that scenario of understanding Northway is large in the world of Kimberlite diatreme, uh, breccia pipe size. It looks like it's fully preserved. You can see the crater. That means that entire pipe is below your drill. It looks like it's, the, it's part of a new Paleozoic Kimberlite field that we didn't know about in the Northern Superior Craton and has never been explored for. And lastly, this is garnet-bearing eclogite, calophyte rims, pax spherules, and I would just leave you with that, that possibility of what if the Kimberlite breccia pipe at Northway is tapping the same deep diamond-bearing crustal material that Victor was. And so hopefully, we're back in about eight weeks. That drill is on the top and the edge. We're simply going to move to the middle of this pipe and complete one or two long drill holes down into and through this breccia pipe. I can produce real detailed compositional characterization of the pipe, and we will be sampling every millimeter of both holes to do a diamond assessment. <laughs> With that, uh, in the world of blue sky exploration, we live on forward-looking statements. That's what we do with our work. Please be aware of those. These are on the website. And thank you very much.